Welcome, everybody. It's Thursday, August 3rd. My name is Robert Sagers. I'm one of the product managers at Sierra Interactive. It's time for another Sierra Mastermind. Today, we're going to be talking about a really important topic that I know is top of mind for a ton of you because I hear about it a lot, and that is agent recruitment. So as we get into agent recruitment, and even before we uh, introduce our esteemed guest, I want to start with a poll. I want to start with a poll. If you're watching live, you can go ahead and take part in this poll. And that is how important is agent recruitment to you? Choose one, very important, kinda important, not important. Let's just kind of set the stage for the importance as we get into this topic. Well, Mike Novak, uh, big friend of Sierra, a friend to me, really glad to have you here today. Why don't you introduce yourself, Mike, and tell us a little bit about what you do, where you are, and your current business setup. Yeah, thanks so much, Robert. And it's it's awesome to be back with you on another mastermind with the Sierra community. Uh, my wife, Rachel, and I, we run a real estate team in Everett, Washington, which is just north of Seattle. Um, so up in Washington State, we've got about 18 people on our team, seven producing agents, um, a couple showing partners, a couple listing partners. Um, and a support staff as well. We're part of Real Brokerage. We came over to Real Brokerage in uh, November of 2021, which has been transformative for our business and for our family as well. Um, but we're just passionate about real estate. Like we, we love helping other agents grow. We help love helping buyers and sellers. Um, you know, like somebody asked me, Eric Hatch, a good buddy of mine who you know too, Robert, he asked me um, like two or three years ago, he's like, Mike, what is your mission? Like, what what is it? Why are you here on earth? And I was like, well, I think, you know, it's a big question, first of all. And I said, my my mission, I feel, is to expand the idea of what is possible. And whether that's with buyers or sellers, whether that's with agents, I want to try to push the envelope on what we can do, whether it's as a husband, as a father, as a real estate agent, as a team leader, as a coach, whatever. I want to push the envelope on what we can do. And you and I have done that a lot with Sierra on feature expanding. Like we've, we've you know, in the five years we've been working together, gosh, we've launched automations, we've launched the mobile app. Now we've got group texting going on. Like we have stacked the features in Sierra the last five years. So that partnership has been super cool and something I'm also fired up and, and passionate about and grateful for. Yeah, I agree about that. All right, let me ask you this question. Um, and that is just to kind of set the stage. We'll get back to our poll results. Again, if you haven't voted, uh, tell us how important agent recruitment is to you. Uh, why, Mike, does a proper framework for agent recruitment matter? Let's kind of set the tone for, you know, when we're talking about agent recruitment, what is it? Why does it matter? Why does having a good framework for it matter? Well, it, it only matters if you want to scale your team. Like that, that's the first thing I want to be super clear about. Like that not, not everyone should build a team. You know, there's days where Rachel and I look at each other like, why the hell do we even have a real estate team? Um, so the first thing is, is, do you actually want to grow? If you want to grow, then why do you want to grow? That's usually the first question I'm going to ask somebody. But uh, assuming you do want to grow, then you, you're going to have to add agents at some point. Like if you want to help, help more buyers, help more sellers, be able to travel, have some kind of balance to your life, you're either going to have to add leverage to your own personal production with showing partners, or you're going to have to add agents um, to, to you know spread that leverage out a little bit more. We've done both. You know, we've got partners, um, which we've talked about in other webinars, and we of course have other agents on our team. Um, but we're we're a small team. Like I said, we only have seven producing agents, right? So we don't have a hundred agents on our team. We're very like careful about who we add to our ecosystem. We're very careful and protective of our um, our culture as well. And so we're not just like a big hire fast kind of team. Um, but it, it matters if you want to increase your leverage, if you want to have scalability, if you want to have a bigger impact. You're going to at some point have to consider adding agents to do those things. Right. And we'll get into the process because it's not just going to be probably something you want to, you know, just throw something out there and see who comes. Like when we need to grow, let's just get right. people, let's just get bodies in the door. We'll yeah. get back to that though. Yeah. Let's come back sure. to that. I mean, identifying your demographic or your avatar is a really important part of this process. Yes. Well, let's just go ahead and get this out of the way now. Um, because when we're talking about agent recruitment, um, and you mentioned you're with Real Brokerage. Uh, yep. So folks who are with real folks who are with EXP, there's, you know, there's a special emphasis on agent recruitment, and these things. So I just want to get it out of the way now, get cards on the table. Why did you join real? This is obviously not a commercial for real, but just, yep. just as with a brokerage that's like focused on recruiting agents, you know, what was the story for you? 
I, you know, I really liked EXP's business model. Um, the culture, like we were at EXP for a few months in 2019. I loved their business model, the economics. I felt like that was kind of the future of real estate, but their culture just, and their values just didn't feel completely aligned to our team. So we went back to Keller Williams and I thought we'd be at Keller Williams for forever just because it was a great ecosystem for us. And we felt very supported and loved there, but then real came on my radar in 21. And I just, you know, as the team leader and as an entrepreneur, I felt like I had a responsibility to at least look at this business model and learn about it, to at least know what I'm saying to basically, right? Uh, and the more, more I looked into real, the more I was really captivated by it. I was captivated by the leadership and I was captivated by the model as well. Like they, they what they were building was very unique and it was super ground floor. There was 2,200 agents at real when we were evaluating it, we took our time, you know, looking at this move. It took us about four months to qualify everything out before we decided to move our team into uh, over to real brokerage. But ultimately, the leadership is what convinced us. The economics convinced us. And then being able to scale our impact also convinced us. You know, Rachel and I have long considered getting into coaching at a deep level um, mm -hmm. to be able to help more agents. And we've kind of stayed away from that. And so agent mentorship is something that is near and dear to our heart. But this allows us to mentor people, to coach people without actually having to hop on a Zoom call with them an hour a week and discuss why they're not picking up the phone and calling their leads and things like that. We don't like the babysitting part of coaching. We love the inspiration part of it and the strategy part of it. Yeah. Okay. And that makes sense. So, so tell me, uh, let, just kind of put this out here. How does uh, agent recruitment matter or play into a part of your brokerage setup? Well, I mean, obviously, Real has a downline format, just like EXP has. So you make money when you bring people to Real if <clears> you <throat> downline, but you only make money if they're successful in selling houses, right? So you get like, you know, a small percentage of the deals that they do up to their cap. Um, for us, like there was a lot of synergy between being at Real and also growing <clears throat> our team because we have conversations with agents all the time that want to be on our team that they're not really a good fit for our team, if I'm being completely honest. And they're a great fit to be at real. Like they, they, it makes sense to partner with them and lock arms with them in a different capacity, more of a mentorship um, and kind of a partnership capacity versus like directly in the trenches, in the office, grinding day-to-day -day in real estate with us. And so it was nice to have that other opportunity to be able to offer people if they weren't a fit for our team. Because I'd say out of, the, out of if we ever be 10 people in person, um, that means we probably looked at 150 applicants. And out of those 10 people, we may make an offer to one. You know what I mean? Like we're just super selective on who we're going to bring into our ecosystem and offer an agent position. It's not just something we we bring people into like some other teams do. Yeah, that's really interesting. So let's let's say this, because you've been a now that we've kind of got some of that that downline part of you know on the table. Um, what about those who are listening now or in the future um, who aren't a part of a downline system, right? They're not, they're not with real, they're not with eXp. Does agent recruitment matter to them? It does if you want to build a team, for sure. Like, I mean, mm -hmm. if you want to scale your operation and build a bigger business and a bigger life, then yeah. Um, but like I said, I want to be completely transparent that building a team is not for everybody. Um, and I don't think it's for most people. You really have to want to be in a leadership capacity and have a servant mind and heart to want to do that. Right. Just because you're a great agent does not mean you're going to be a great team leader. I want to be very clear about that. Yeah, well, let's, let's get back to that. Let's go to our poll results. So poll one, how important is agent recruitment to you? And half of you, a little over half, said very important, 53%. Uh, about a quarter of you said kind of important and Quarter of you, though here, and I respect and appreciate that <laughs> not important. Yeah. Yeah. I'm curious why you're on the webinar. <laughs> they just want to hear us talk about things, and that's okay because I think maybe by the time that we're done here, uh, it, it may be more important, especially as we talk about scaling your business and growing and why recruiting the right agents matters and that type of a thing, Mike. Um, so tell me why agent kind of to you, you would you'd be in the very important camp, right? If you had voted, Mike, you would have said very important. I tried um, to vote on a pop-up and it wouldn't let me. So yes, add me. As, a, as a panelist, you can't vote <laughs> and, and neither can I. Um, but I, I too would have said very important. Um, why does agent recruitment matter to you personally? You spoke a little bit about this with coaching and mentoring, but <clears throat> expound. I mean, to me, it matters to continue to build a bigger and more impactful business. Like there's, I have, I have a couple of really big goals, right? Like I want to build 
a, a massive empire within real brokerage, meaning I'm influencing and impacting hundreds of agents, maybe thousands of agents across the country. And real gives me the platform and the ability to do that. Um, so that is very, very important. I believe that I can help people go much, much further than they could on their own. Uh, and, and so I have that firm belief and I want to do that. When it comes to building my team, uh, I'm a little bit more pulled back on it. Like I'm not somebody that's, like I said, I'm not trying to add like 20 agents to my organization, but as agents come across uh, my radar that I think could be a good fit, I do want to add them to my organization just to continue to elevate their life and to continue to elevate the team's position within our county as well. It's important to me that we're the best team in our county, um, that we're the number one team. One of our, you know, one of our attributes, like one of our key statements we've always had on kind of our vision statements that we're unapologetically number one in Snohomish County, which is our county. And that is completely true. Like we want to be number one. We want to stay number one, continue to grow. So to me, stagnation is death and I'm not interested in staying stagnant. I like that. Let's go to their second poll. Second poll, multiple choice where you can select more than one if you wish. What is your process for recruiting agents? Uh, you got pages on your website. Uh, are you working with agents to be or getting their license? They're in real estate school. Uh, are you poaching from other bro brokerages? Well, let's be honest here. We, we cannot see who votes. Uh, some form of advertising or other, let us know in the comments. And uh, speaking of those comments, if you're watching live, tell us where you're at. David says hi from Sarasota, Florida. Beth Ann in Hampstead, North Carolina. Our friend Scott, uh, Louisville, Kentucky. And if you haven't, let us know where you are. Let us know. And we'll be sure to shout out your place of residence. Um, Mike, have you ever personally been recruited? Mm, only by them. <laughs> only, yeah, got it. Yeah, um, I'm yeah. Right, okay. Um, Tell, tell me about that process, if you're willing to share a little bit about it. What was it like for you to have been recruited? I mean, he, he just knew I was getting into real estate. This was when I was a brand new agent and we had a previous relationship and he reached out to me and, and he was always like, what's kind of cool about Ben Kinney is he's got, I don't know, 1800 agents in his brokerages, but he's super hands-on when it comes to stuff like that. And he, he sent me a text and then a call and just said, Hey, I think I heard you're get, uh, getting into real estate. Uh, I'd love to be your home for that and talk to you further about it. And, you know, we hadn't had a conversation like six years. We used to have a relationship uh, because we live very close together when I was a builder and a real estate developer and he was um, in real estate sales. So we knew each other from that. Um, but he kept the relationship and just kind of going, you know, every couple of years and he just, you know, made sure that he was top of mind with it. So he wasn't like out hard selling me. He wasn't pitching me. He was just making sure that he knew that he was a good option for us to consider when we got into real estate. Yeah, and we'll come back to uh, a little bit more about that and, and tactics and approaches as we talk about those uh, poll results. But um, I, I do want to dive deeper in there. And I know you spoke to this a little bit as well, but let's expound upon when someone should know, like when will they know that it is time to start recruiting to your team, to your brokerage, apart from the economics of it, let's just take that off the table with, uh, with some of the brokerage setups. But what pain points, what awarenesses, where, uh, where will people be feeling, where should they be processing that, hey, it's time to start growing? Yeah, uh, that's a good question. I think, you know, as soon as you start feeling <clears throat> kind of pressure, you know, like, like you start feeling these kind of pressure cracks up in your organization, whether if it's, you know, a ball being dropped, whether if it's not being able to get to all of your leads in a, in a proper time, things like that. Um, I don't think adding agents just to service more leads is necessarily the best strategy. Like I would rather cut back my lead spend than do that. Oftentimes that's the catalyst for people to add agents is that they're drowning in lead opportunities and they want agents to get in and start calling these opportunities for them and convert. Um, them into something because they don't have any time to do it. So oftentimes it's going to come from uh, a personal agent, you know, who's the rainmaker and they have a big pipeline. They've got a lot of business. It's more business than they can handle. And that's when they say, oh crap, you know, I need some help. I need to bring some agents in. And like the old version of this, like the old KW version is typically that rainmaker that ends up in a listing agent capacity. They bring in a buyer agent and that, that buyer agent um, gives them a lot of leverage to focus on their listing business. Right. And so for you personally, you said pressure cracks in your organization. You said it's not necessarily about having too many lead opportunities. Is that right? I just think it's a mistake to like, if that's the sole reason you're adding agents, I think that that's possibly a mistake. Like you, you have to, again, really self-examine and say, 
do I want to lead other people? Am I committed to doing that? Or am I just putting a bandaid on a problem? Because like, there's a lot of other ways to solve that problem. We could add an ISA, right? We could add a showing partner um, to have more leverage. Uh, we could pull back our lead spend. Like those are all three viable things as well beyond just adding agents. So I would just want to really look at the entire picture before just saying, hey, adding agents is the best solution to this lead flow problem. And too often, agents just seem to say, hey, I've got too many leads, let's add agents now. And I don't think that that in and of itself is the launching point to add. Okay, so I want to go just a little bit deeper on this because um, I can guarantee you that people out there are thinking, I have... I, ha I do not have, this might be how they think about it. I don't have enough time to contact all these leads. I need to have more people to uh, contact these leads, okay? So let's, let's, I know that you, Mike, in particular, are super focused on efficiency and systems optimization. So if somebody is in that kind of place and they say, Mike, I don't have enough time to contact all these people. What are going to be some of your follow-up questions to diagnose whether it's really time to start adding agents or if there's some other things to take a look at? My first question would be, I'd say, Robert, you know, tell me about the leverage that you've surrounded yourself with. Who is supporting you and what exactly are they doing? Like, do you have an admin? What do they do for you? Do you have contract to close coordinator? What do they do for you? Do you have a marketing person? What do they do for you? Do you have a showing partner? What do they do for you? Like, let again, back to calling leads, like leads are the most expensive thing you're going to invest in in your business other than people. And so you, when you add agents into your organization, those people are typically going to have the lowest skill set when it comes to converting leads. You as a rainmaker likely have a very deep skill set when it comes to converting leads. And so I'd rather have you still be the person calling these people and adding leverage in other areas of your business before you hand off the actual calling of leads to other agents. And I would even personally add an ISA to my business before I'd add other agents. Like I would have added a an admin, I would add a showing part, I would add an ISA. And then if I still wanted to grow more, that's when I would add an agent at that point. So I would have filled those other three buckets to take my personal production as big as possible. And I would have really broken down and systematized the transaction to where I'm only doing a couple things. I'm talking to people and setting the appointment, I'm doing the consultation and I'm negotiating the deal. Every Someone does everything else for me. So your pushback or diagnostic question would not be, you know, it wouldn't be like, cool, let's start talking about how you can add the right agents. It would be, um, how can you leverage your time better, you know, through support in a way that you can talk to all those people yeah. until you get to the point you, where you really can't talk to all those people. Yes. And, and, and like I said, and then add an ISA and then consider adding agents. Okay. It's, it's just much more profitable. Like, like I mean, I know you said you don't want to talk about the economics, but let's be super direct about the like when you have a, an agent, team, um, you know, you're maybe giving them 40 or 50 percent of the transaction. It's a huge amount of money to hand off. If you could hold on to more of that money with your personal production, and maybe you give five percent to a showing partner, maybe you give five percent to an ISA. Now I've got 10 percent coming off the top, plus we're paying some salaries. You're going to make so much more money than giving away half of every dollar that comes into an agent. It's just, it, it's a much more profitable model. I'm not saying adding agents isn't the right way to go. It's just all about timing and sequence. Yeah, I'm with you. And and not talking about economics, certainly didn't want to not touch on it just in terms of the downline systems, et cetera. Um, that makes total sense when somebody is considering uh, what does it look like for me to grow? There is that economic factor. Absolutely. Otherwise, why would you even be questioning and making decisions like that? Right. Um, and, and our industry has, has this like this weird kind of thing to it where it's like an illusion where people think that you grow this massive team and you no longer have to come in the office. You no longer have to talk to people. You no longer have to do anything. You can just simply go travel the world, sit on a beach and enjoy your life and count your money. And that's just not the way that it works for anybody. And so the longer you stay in production and the longer you hold on to as much production as possible, the more profitable you're going to be. Like the biggest money-making position in this industry is being the rainmaker that sells houses. It just is. You're going to make more than anyone else. You're going to make more than recruiters. You're going to make more than anyone else if you're just the person that's selling the houses and you're the rainmaker. So I do want to ask about that because I think that's actually a lot of people's goals, stated or otherwise, uh, which is... Uh, I want to get out of production. And it might be, uh, again, stated or otherwise, sub point being as quickly as possible. Yeah, and you're I saying don't do that. I was out of production in 2018. I, I was completely out, 100%. 
All I did was team leader responsibilities, which was a lot of work. Um, but we had 20 agents on our team. I was coaching and mentoring people nonstop. Um, we were just in agent growth mode at that point. I completely stepped out of production. And it, it really had a big impact on our team's profitability. Like the profitability took a, a big swing down. I was our number one producer, like most rainmakers are. And you you sideline that producer and that that production and that income, it has a huge impact on your financials. So you got to be very, very careful about doing that. Eric, again, not to go back to Eric Hatchigan, but him and I have had a lot of conversations about the right time to step out of production completely. And we both feel like that number is in the four to 500 units a year where you're actually out. Yeah, and that's a significant number, right? That's a I huge mean, that's, number. Yeah, yeah, that's not a first year, uh, that's not a get out as <laughs> quickly as possible number again. Yeah. Uh, let's go to those poll results, second poll results. And that was, you know, what is your process for recruiting agents? 10% of you website, 10% of you working with uh, agents who are getting their license, 30% poaching from other brokerages, 60% some other form of advertising or some form of advertising and 30% of you with other, with some other things. Uh, let's go ahead and shout out to Lakewood Ranch, Florida. Frank, hello. Brandon in Phoenix, stay cool. Brandon, I don't know if that's possible in Phoenix these days, but stay cool if you can. Um, so let's talk about this, Mike. And I know you've got, again, back to systems optimization. Uh, you have got a pretty dialed in uh, and extensive, which you've alluded to, process that you implement uh, for agent recruitment. Yeah. And so I would love to kind of go through that step-by-step step with you, your personal process for agent recruitment. So let's say that you are at the point where you've optimized to the point where you say the only way to continue growing now is to add more agents. You've reached that point. What do you do next? Uh, the first thing you should do is sit down and define the agent you're looking for. What are the characteristics of these people? Um, what's their mindset? What's their, are they a new agent? Are they an experienced agent? What, what are you looking for? Like on our team, um, the, we have decided that new agents aren't a great fit for our ecosystem. We have an entry level position and that's the showing partner role. Um, you can intern there for two years with an experienced agent and then have the option to graduate up into a buyer agent, but you don't start there on our team if you're a new agent for us. We just don't do that well with new agents. So we figured that out and we're okay with that, you know? Okay, but, real quick, what's a showing, what does the showing partner do? Somebody comes in there, so a new a agent. showing partner is assigned to an elite agent, like someone that's going to sell 30 to a hundred homes a year. And they directly report to that elite agent. And so like, I've got my own showing partner. My wife, Rachel has her own listing partner. Chuck on our team has his own showing partner. Like, and that person brings a tremendous amount of leverage to that agent. They do a couple of very big things. They bring them leverage when it comes to showing houses, of course, to setting up inspections and attending them, to communicating with clients. Um, it, just, it buys you back a lot of your time. They also typically will act as you with a CRM. So like my showing partner is me inside of CR Interactive. If you text with me more often than not, it's actually my showing partner on the other end that's engaging with you. Um, mm -hmm. So they do those types of things. But if you like really implement the showing partner model well, um, you can get your your hours per transaction down below about three hours per deal. And if you think about how much money you're making, that's a super profitable place to be. Like in 21, I sold 80 houses for about $44 million. This is my personal production, not the team, just my own personal pipeline. And I spent about three hours per transaction. But again, all I did was set the appointment, do the consultation, negotiate the deal. Everything else, somebody else did. Because the time consuming part is the show in homes. Again, I track data very closely. I'm a big fan of CSU. shout out to them. Um, and they, uh, we tracked how many homes were we showing per closed client. And it was at that point, the market was pretty tight on inventory. We averaged 11.7 homes shown per closing. That's a mm -hmm. lot of time. Mm -hmm. Right. You know what I mean? Yeah. And the reason why, like oftentimes they're often two or three times during that market to actually win a house. So it was, it was just a longer process than normal, but that's when you, we had to scale up on the partners. And so that, that's what that role is. It's a great internship type role. Um, it gives them really the opportunity to learn from the ground up and for the team, it gives the team a chance to really pour into somebody, make sure they're a really good culture fit before they just kind of give them the keys to the kingdom. Our industry has an 87% failure rate. I'm sure you've all heard that statistic. So we don't have a good track record of helping people bridge that gap from their nine to five job becoming a very successful agent. The sharing partner model has changed that game completely and it builds a bridge between those two things. Yeah, okay. So in, in your model, I mean, sharing partner is not a go get me coffee type of a thing. This is like, you are really learning, you are getting poured into, it is a way for you to learn all kinds of things from somebody who 
is, in your words, an elite agent uh, and, and really get into the industry in a way that hopefully can bridge the gap from, you know, nine to five to a full-time agent. Okay. So and it has a salary too. Like we pay them about, it's typically 40,000 in our market. They have a base salary so they can actually survive. And, you know, right. Exactly. Okay. So um, you, you mentioned first, write down what you're looking for in an ideal okay. agent, right? So you've got to have that goal in mind right up front for, and we kind of went on a the segue to say um, y'all don't, bring on brand new agents. You work them in through the showing partner model. All right. So what is your ideal agent, Mike? I look at the agents on my team that have been successful to answer okay. that question. And we're, and we're often like having this conversation within our leadership team. Like, what are we really looking for? Well, what's been really successful already within our organization? And typically right. it's people that have been in the industry for between two and four years, and they've sold between five and 10 homes a year. So they've been somewhat successful, but they definitely have not broken through. And they're often wearing multiple hats. Like they're doing their own transaction coordination. Maybe they're setting their own appointments. They're the buyer agent. They're the listing agent. They're the listing coordinator. They're the showing agent. Like they're everything. And so they're massively under leveraged and they typically don't have the money for a lot of lead opportunities either. So that's the kind of person that I feel like we can take and we can create a much, much bigger life for it. Like I, I've talked about Chuck a few times and Chuck is a really good example of this. Chuck was selling about eight homes a year on average, came on our team, Chuck sells 40 houses a year. Now Chuck makes a lot of money at this point. And sure, he's got splits with the team, but at the end of the day, do you care about the split that you pay to the team or how much money you end up making? It's just like helping a seller. Do you care how much you pay me as the agent or how much you net when you sell the house? Well, you have to provide a system where agents can sell much, much more and find efficiencies and productivity through being aligned with you as a team leader. Mm -hmm. And and that creates a, a culture in which everybody is winning, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you look to your existing team, you say who is successful, and you start picking up these different characteristics uh, of who has actually succeeded within your existing culture. Um, and then you start, you know, what do you do next? You pull out a, an advertisement in, in the Seattle News Times, or what do you do? <laughs> so uh what we do um and, and we just like we, we are always overhauling our systems like we're never really happy with where things are at but we we use wise hire as our applicant tracking system so people get ported into wise hire we get their resume we get their disc profile and typically like for an agent we're looking for like an is an si or a di or an id like someone who's going to be pretty assertive but also be engaging with people that's why that i is so important so if you don't know about this go look it up it's pretty important just to make sure you match people's personality to the right position and for agents that's just what's worked really well for us um so we will we'll put them through that and then we will typically hop on the phone with them and just have kind of a cursory conversation with them better understand who they are um, how they talk, like what's their bedside manner like, you know, is this someone that I actually want to continue to pursue this, um, this engagement with? And if things go good on the phone consultation, we will then typically send them um, a Google form. In that Google form, there's a couple of questions for them to answer. And there's also just like a very basic task to complete where they go create a Google document and they share with us on that Google document the answers to a couple of questions. That shows us a base level of technical competency. You'd be shocked. I know, Robert, you're in product, but there's a lot of people out there that can't create a Google Doc and share it with you. <laughs> so we're just like kind of creating these hoops that people yeah, can right. jump yeah. through or trip over. And if they trip over it, that flushes them out, you know, and intentionally. Right. So, so it, it, it's, it's a, it, and as you go through these increasingly more difficult steps and get further into the process, it gets harder, you know, and ultimately the final step is a panel interview um, with our leadership group uh, to make sure that the whole leadership group feels good about you. And that's typically like an hour, an hour and a half long and then we make a decision. And on our panel, like we've kind of got an agreement that if one person says no, everyone's saying no. You know, that's just kind of what we found works. Like when someone has a red flag and they're on that leadership group, that's enough to us to just say, hey, okay, I'm not going to work, you know? Okay. Um, I'm going to pull back just a little bit. Um, you, the technical hurdles totally make sense because you were leveraging technology at a high level. I mean, you're not, you know, writing code every day as a real estate professional, but you are using a CRM, you're using uh, different softwares, you know, in conjunction with each other. And you want to know that somebody has just a basic level of technical aptitude, right? So you're not having yeah. to walk or, them through. Or even more importantly, if you don't, can you right. figure it out on your own? <laughs> right. Yeah, you know exactly. I mean? Right. 
Uh, you, you mentioned earlier, you don't love the babysitting component of it. That might fall into that yeah, category. Yeah, that's where right? babysitting shows up. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Um, so you you work through it and and you've got the leadership panel. So who gets to be on your leadership panel to decide who comes on to the team? So it's Rachel, it's Jen, who you know really well, um, Chuck and myself. Right. And and how does somebody get on to the leadership panel? Oh, um, they have to be on our team for at least three years and they have to hit a certain production level if they're an agent as well. And they have to be a, a 10 out of 10 culture. Like if you're um, like a seven out of 10, eight out of 10, whatever, then you're automatically not going to get. Um, so it's on. success. Yeah. It's it's longevity, which is going to relate almost directly to culture fit. Yeah. Is longevity. Yeah. Right. Okay. So and those the folks panel has to, the current group has to agree that university are a fit. Right. Okay. So those are the folks who are going to be able to discern and say this person would work well after they've jumped through hoops and, and all of the rest. Um, and one person says no, everybody says no. So there's got to be obviously a trust factor that must be central to your culture. Yeah. Uh, is that right? Okay. I mean, um, the people in that group, like we're, we're not only very close personal friends, but very deep, you know, work associates as well. Chuck has been on our team since the team started. Um, he's sold several hundred homes on our team at this point. Jen has been on our team for three and a half, four years now. Like the level of trust within the four of us is super, super deep. Okay. And and so tell me uh, as you're going through that, like how important is it for you to protect your existing culture as you bring on new agents? How does it's that, at what, like, where does that rank? I, I mean, it's the top. Like we, we care more about that than we care about your ability to sell. Like we can teach you to sell. Um, like we need to see some kind of history of success in the past. Like, and I'm not talking massive success. Like I said, like, you know, that four to 10 units is kind of a sweet spot. Um, but something that shows us that you've got that internal drive to be successful as an agent. If you're there, then you just need to learn, you know, the better ways to do this. Uh, and you need to tap into our leverage and our leads and our leadership. And we're going to catapult your business forward. But if you're a, a culture issue, that's automatically a deal killer for us, you know, and oftentimes it's, it's what you hear and what you don't hear that tells you they're not a culture fit, you know. Right. Okay. And, and tell me this, just because I, I feel like it's so important to what you're talking about. How do you suss out culture fit? What kinds of questions do you ask? What kinds of intuitions do you have that since it's the most important aspect for you, what are you looking for? We're looking for humility. Like, I mean, we have awesome, badass people on our team, but every single one of them is humble. Like we're confident, but we have humility. We know that we don't know everything, right? We're, we're humble enough to ask for help when we need it. Um, so we really are cautious about arrogance. Arrogance to us is like a huge red flag. Um, usually that's hiding or masking something to us. And we try to flesh out what that could be. Understanding why they want to be on a team is very important to me as well. If you want to be on a team just for leads, to me, that's usually like, boom, you're out right then and there. Just because the like, leads come and go, you can get your own leads. Like you, you have to want to be part of something bigger than you to actually be on our team and for that to be a fit. I'm also super leery about people that tell me they just want to learn from me. If you want to learn from me, come to real. We can mentor you. That's a better fit. Don't come on my team at that point. So it, it's a lot of just like listening to what people say and knowing from experience that's a red flag. Oh, I need to dive deeper into that. Oh, I heard him say, um, you know, that he's just come my team for leave. That's not going to work for me. You know, like things like that. And, and people, it, when you engage with enough conversation with them, they their true colors definitely will show through. It takes a, a process of getting there and different formats. Like I said, like a Google form or Google document, phone interview, in-person interview, group interview. But eventually their true colors do come out in that process at some point more often than not. I have so many additional questions, so I'm going to, I might keep going. Um, right. The, with this, I, I just saw this, this uh, video of, I think it's Simon Sinek, um, who was talking about uh, Navy mm -hmm. SEALs. And, yeah. And, and uh, an access of high performance and high trust and how there's tons of people out there who are high performers and low trust. And those are toxic leaders that will eviscerate your culture, but in Navy SEALs, the way he described it, um, you, what you, you would prefer to have somebody who is high trust and medium performance or even relative high trust, low performance, yeah. uh, rather than having somebody who's high performance and low trust. And so it just is aligning so much with what you're saying around a culture fit with somebody who shows they've got the ability to get after it, right? Even if their numbers don't blow you out of the water, uh, even if they don't have a, a, a 
ton of track record of being like the most amazing, you know, performer in real estate ever, you're willing to take somebody who fits the culture and shows that they've got the drive to learn, to be humble, to, to be poured into and succeed. Uh, your words, using so many big words like catapult and grow and be the best and this type of a thing, that person will typically, you found in your experience, that person's going to work. That yeah. person's going to work on your team. Yeah, the, the, they've got the humility. Um, they know what they don't know. Like the, they're they're conscious about that. Like they're they're very um, emotionally aware of themselves as well. Like they can read a room. They can, they can pick up on cues. Like those little things are huge. Right. Okay. So uh, last thing I'll ask about this is you mentioned from experience about red flags without giving away any personally identifiable information. Anything you want to share where something where you or a member of your leadership team denied a red flag and pushed through it and it came back to bite you? Yeah. Has that ever happened to you? Oh, oh, it's happened probably 10 times for sure. I mean, every, every single time we've made an exception on something where like, I've got, you know, uh, like I want to push forward with it, but Jen's got a red flag. It always blows up in my face in some way, shape or form. Last year, I made the the unilateral decision, which I very rarely do in our team. And I shouldn't have done it um, to add someone to our organization because it opened up an expansion market for us. And I didn't put them through the normal process we have to get people vetted into our organization. Came back to bite me in the ass super bad. And he ended up not working out. He's still a partner of ours at Real. But it just, it really didn't set proper expectations for him on what the team was looking for from him to be successful in our ecosystem. And so anytime I've short-circuited the process or anytime I've heard a red flag, it seems like it comes back to bite us in the ass. Um, you know, and, and like same thing with like the producing side of things. Like you, you get like a really aggressive person. And to me, I like that. Like, I'm like, oh man, I really like how aggressive this person's going to be. Like, they're going to get out there, get, they're going to get on the phone and kick some ass and get some shit done. But then you start diving deeper into it and you're like, oh man, this person's going to really be abrasive to everyone else in our office. They're probably going to piss a lot of people off mm -hmm. and not care about the disruptive waves that they're creating. You know, it's okay to create waves, but you have to be aware of what those look like and how they're impacting other people and have some empathy as well, you know? So if you take, if, if someone's out there and it's like, I need to get agents in and they, they don't really have a process or they short circuit the process that they do have, which by the way, I imagine Mike, um, talking about building culture, you got to come back to Jen and anybody else on the team and say, my bad. And oh yeah, no, I had to throw a bad on that one. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> like, so you I, got I, to put in that my <laughs> Yeah, right. You get to own it and show some humility and that yeah. helps rebuild that trust, right? In the, in the culture that you've built uh, together. Um, so, so really the culture could erode if you take more of a turn and burn approach. I know, you, you know, you've got some restaurant background you, where you get people into a table and you're trying to get them eaten and then on the way out, right? That that's one way to run a restaurant, for example, it's a way you could run a real estate team. You bring in agents, you churn agents, et cetera. What are the downfalls uh, to that kind of approach. It's faster. Only the quickest way to kill your culture and to also burn out your staff. Like you're, you're like I, I told you the pieces you need to have in place before you add agents. Let's assume you've added those pieces. You've got that transaction coordinator. You've got showing partner leverage. You've got ISAs within your team, and now they start working with other agents in your team too. If they, if they burn your staff out because they, there's just this nonstop cycle of training and open doors where people are coming and going, coming and going, coming and going, and they're always starting over every week with somebody new, they will burn out and leave. And your staff is your biggest value proposition as you build a team. Like they are your leverage. They are your experience. Like our transaction coordinator, just to give you an example, she's been with us for five years. She knows our contracts inside and out. She knows our systems inside and out. She's also our managing broker at this point. Like she has so much experience and knowledge. But if I just throw new agents at her every week and she has to babysit these people and walk them through how to write contracts, how to not get in trouble with our MLS, that's going to burn her out. And so that's the biggest concern I would have to that concept of just throwing agents in there is what's that going to do to your culture and to your staff? And it's not going to be good. I can guarantee you the way that that ends and it's not going to be pretty. So it is faster to get more people onto the team. It is also faster to erode, erode your culture and burn out your staff. You're just going to repeat the exact same process too. Like you're, you're going to end up replacing those agents. They're not going to work out. And then you're going to very quickly be replacing your entire staff as well, because they're going to be gone from burning out from working with these dipshit agents. 
So speaking of the disk profile, I mean, tons of high D people probably watching this now and in the future. Um, your advice is uh, be a high D, but with a process that has proven results when you're recruiting agents. If you're a high D, you need someone with some C around you. <laughs> yeah, okay, <laughs> yeah. If you look at the disk, I'm a 99 D, I'm like an 80 C, right? And so I'm able to like create processes and standards, but also like push super hard uh, and get through things. But if you don't take the time to establish process, then you're running blind and you're just going to end up repeating the process again because those agents don't want to work out. Let's go to our third poll. A third poll. Yeah, this is another select one. And let's talk about this. I know the topic is agent recruitment, uh, but I think just on the flip side, you have to talk about retention as well. How important is agent retention to you? Select one, very important, kind of important and not important. That is retaining the agents you've already got. Um, let's let's flip the script slightly, Mike, and say, what, you know, if, if somebody's watching who um isn't well, and maybe even just seeing it from an empathy perspective, uh, even if you're not the one looking to maybe join a team or a brokerage. But why is it important to an individual agent to join the right team, the right brokerage? What kinds of thought processes should they be having as they're going through, uh, say, a, a set of interviews or Google form responses, et cetera? I mean, I, I think that if you're an agent looking to join a team, you need to figure out why. This is just the same question I'm asking the team leader. Why are you forming a team? Well, as an agent, why are you trying to join a team? Like, why is that important to you? Why are you better off doing that than doing this on your own? And and your odds of success, in particular, as a new agent joining a team, go up astronomically. So there's zero question about that. But understanding that why is super important. Are you planning to be on a team for two years and just learn what you need and then bounce? Or are you joining a team for longevity or to do things that you don't like to do? Like, what, what is the reasoning behind that? You know, but if you're a, a lot of agents join a team for a couple of years and they take off because they learned or got what they needed and then they're out. And that that's, I guess, okay for an agent, but that to me as a team leader is not what I'm looking for. Um, you know, that's why I told you, like when we're talking about red flags, if someone tells me they want to learn from me, that's a huge red flag. Okay. Right. Right. Exactly. Um, and okay. There's, there's probably more to say on that. Do we have results on the third poll? Do we have results? Let's if we do, let's go ahead and show them. Uh, and let's, springboard off of the third poll results coming they'll come let me answer it for you agent yeah. retention should be your number one recruiting strategy so you're thinking at the end as you go into it and i think that's that's right right mike i mean if you well, what i'm saying on, is don't don't go add agents when you're not taking care of the ones you've got right? Like when you think about how to allocate your time, you damn well better take great care of the people you've already got before you start thinking about allocating time to adding more. That's what I'm saying. So how do you personally, Mike, uh, how are you thinking about retaining agents? I was uh, just talking, we'll meet him here in a moment. Somebody the other day who said this, this is, I'm quoting uh, agents, and it goes right back to what you just said, Mike, agents at most stay with a team for 12 to 15 months and then think they know it all and go out on their own only to figure out it's not that easy. Um, how do you focus? So let's take that last part off the table and say that they figure out it's not so easy. But have you found that agents at most, you talked about longevity in your team. Have you found that the typical agent will stick around for 12, 15, 18, 24 months and then move on? Not on my team. No, I mean, I've like, we don't have a big team. We've got seven people, like I said, but Chuck has been here since our team started. Dale has been here since our team started. So that we're going back to 2017, right? Like these guys have been here for six, seven years now. Um, right. Jen has been here for three and a half, four years. So we don't, we don't turn and burn agents. Like we, we spend a lot of time uh, investing into these people and developing proximity with them, making them feel loved and like they've got our attention. Um, I don't know if you, I'm sure you've read the pumpkin plan, right, Robert? I've not read the pumpkin. Dude, plan. You got to go read that book. Come on. You got me reading shoe dog. You never read the pumpkin plan. <laughs> so the pumpkin plan is all about, <laughs> about how to build a prize pumpkin. Right. And so I use the pumpkin plan strategy when it comes to my top producers, I am disproportionately spending my time with those people. Mm -hmm. Again, there's 17 people in our organization. I spend all of my time with about three of them. Okay. Yeah. So it's not, it's not equal, but it is mm -hmm. fair. Right. Yeah, more to say on that, including it sounds like the kind of book I'd read to my kids at night in October, but uh, I'll check it out, The Pumpkin Plan. Um, I'll ask this. Um, as you're thinking about retention, you said right up front, you're, you should be thinking about retention 
even as you recruit. I mean, it's just the other side of the coin, right? It is one coin, two sides, you recruit, you retain. Um, what are some of the aspects that you implement into your team that uh, you think can be uh, reflective uh, of your ability to retain agents, retain team members? Like I said, I think that you, like what I do, I think that you need to have a way to create disproportionate time for people, right? If people are like, as leaders, our natural design is to want to pour in and spend time with the people that are struggling. And I understand that from an empathy perspective, but it's completely wrong from a business perspective. It's that 80-20 rule. You're spending 80% of your time on people that are generating 20% of the results. Flip that around, spend 80% of your time with people that are producing 80% of the results instead. And so be completely unequal with your time. Spend it on the people that are producing. Pour more into those people. Give people a path to graduate and to grow into the capacity that can earn that time with you, but don't just simply give it to them. That's why we have mentor agents on our team. Like Chuck is a mentor agent. He's got agents that report directly to him. They don't come to me for questions or issues or coaching. They go to Chuck and then Chuck and I have a coaching and a mentor relationship. So we're able to scale it that way. He has earned that time. He's earned that proxy. But give proxy to the people that are your big pumpkins is the biggest retention tool I think I can give you. And also pull them into your process. Like give them a path to having a voice within your organization where they're calling some of the shots. Their voice is heard in the vision and the direction of the team. We do quarterly offsites with our leadership group where we sit down for an entire day and we just unpack the business. What happened last quarter? What are our priorities for the next quarter? What's broken in the business? What's going good? Like, let's just have eight hours of super raw, candid conversations as a leadership group and give them a voice in that. That's interesting. So Mike, you found that as people uh, grow and stay uh, in your on your team, um, it's not just about like, you know, better splits or whatever. It's, it's also the autonomy and the ability to speak into different things about the business, thus having some amount of like personal investment that yeah. is helping to retain them. And, and the other part of retention is the ability to build a longer runway with you. Like how can, and you, you can't keep people in a box, right? Like you have to be able to give them vision on how they could go further with you or they're going to go further without you. So you got to do that. Like, and so that's where, again, the showing partner model comes in. You know, how can I coach somebody to go from 20 units to 40 units a year and work less and make more money? Well, here's a model that you can implement to do that. I'm going to help you implement that in your business and actually pull it off like Chuck has done, you know? So you, building a business within a business ultimately is the place you have to be at to keep those really big producers. Besides the pumpkin plan, uh, what advice would you give to anybody out there who wants to learn more about how best to hire, recruit agents, recruit team members, books, blog posts, YouTube videos, uh, whatever you want to share? Eric Hatch has written um, the Perfect Real Estate Blueprint. He's mastered the hiring process. Much of what we do is got Eric's fingerprints all over it. I would 100% go read that. Um, I wrote the forward for it. <laughs> um, but it's it's a great read and it's super tactical. Like you can get it for 10 bucks and you're going to get all of these systems I'm talking about and uh, just build them out in your business and, and start following his, his best practices for it. When we implemented the stuff back in 2019, um, it changed our culture very quickly. Um, we we stopped adding people nearly as fast. We slowed down quite a bit, but the net result was a much more favorable one and a much better culture. Excellent. Okay. Well, if you've watched this uh, live or in the future, Mike, and somebody wants to reach out to you, how could they find you and what can they do? Find me on Facebook, Instagram, The Real Mike Novak, or uh, my website, novakforreal.com number four um n-o-v-a-k for real.com you can find me there and uh schedule time to chat with me about your business or about real or anything else sierra interactive of course too all right sounds great all right well listen a couple things as we close um i want to introduce all of you to somebody who you may know you may not and that is scott de Reuter. as we continue to involve uh, evolve the sierra mastermind we're going to transition it to the growth team at Sierra Interactive. And Scott will be continuing forward uh, as the host of the Mastermind. Scott, if you're there, go ahead and throw on your camera. And if not, I'm gonna tell you about a few other things before he comes on. Um, one is if you found this Mastermind helpful, be sure to join the next one. If you sign up for this one, then you get to be on our email newsletter for all the future ones and join on anytime live or later. Uh, if you do have any ideas for topics or things that you want to mastermind about, please email us hello at sierrainteractive.com to be sure to let us know. Um, and 
big important thing for us is we are hosting our third annual Sierra Summit. That is going to be October 10 and 11 in Denver, Colorado. I'll be there. Lots of Sierra people are going to be there. We would love to see you in person. It is a two-day event, uh, one day devoted entirely to certification and training. So if you are a Sierra Interactive client, you want to know more about Sierra, you've got somebody on your team that you want to invest more deeply into Sierra, uh, that's going to be a great and awesome day for you. Second day, we've got some really amazing speakers and uh, various other things for you to be able to connect with other people, with folks from Sierra. Um, so it, it's really going to be, I think, a worthwhile investment of your time and your money. Uh, we've got a link there in the chat in Zoom. Uh, did we get Scott back? Is he here? There he is. All right. Yes. Scott DeRoyter. Yes. I was, uh, I was on participation mode, so I was kind of hanging out here with you some are. guys. Hey, you introduce here yourself, now. Scott. So if anybody doesn't know you, who, who you are. All right. Well, thanks a lot, Robert. So hey, my name is Scott DeRoyter. I am the Director of Sales and Partnerships here at Sierra. I uh, took over here back in April. Uh, super excited for the opportunity where Sierra is heading and everything that's going on with them. So, um, so yeah, so, you know, it's, uh, it's going to be an awesome ride as we kind of take some on some new topics and talk about a whole bunch of things that are pertinent to people's businesses in today's market, which is hugely important. Um, I have to say, Mike, what an amazing job. <clears throat> what a great vision and a just a refreshing strategy on recruiting and everything that your team has done from a perspective of looking for quality and not quantity per se. Because, you know, if you do look for that quantity, you do, do burn through agents 12, 15, 18 months and they disappear. And it's a, it's a, it's a hamster wheel, right? And before you even mentioned Eric, I could hear some of the hatchisms coming through, <laughs> yeah. um, you know, in your in your in your direction and how things are going. So uh, thank you, great stuff. So happy you were able to share all that today. Yeah, thank you so much. I appreciate that. All right. Well, listen. We'll see you all the next time. That will be August. Is it August seventeenth, Scott? Seventeenth. Yeah. August seventeenth. And thanks so much for joining. Uh, for those of you who joined live and later, thanks so much. And we'll see you next time. Take care.